Alright, welcome back biology. This is Erickson here covering the second part of section 6.1. Uh, so yesterday we talked a little bit about competitive exclusion with the gray squirrel versus red squirrel. Uh, we also talked about the difference between a habitat and a niche or niche. A habitat is where an organism lives. Okay, I'll show you that. Where it lives. And a niche is how it lives in that environment. Okay. Okay, today I'm going to talk about keystone species and some more like interaction parts, a little bit about symbiosis and the three types of those. But a keystone species is a species that really plays this vital role in the ecosystem or in the environment. Because of them, other organisms thrive in that ecosystem. It brings stability and it brings a lot of biodiversity, a lot of different species to that area. And they're called keystone um, because um, I should say like way back when, and we still use this today, but this block right here holds these blocks for this arch archway. If you were to remove this, this stone, which is called a keystone, uh, this arch would fall apart. All of these would not stay where they're at. So it's really this stone right here that's keeping this archway intact. So that's why they're called keystone, uh, because they're key to this arch or they're key to this ecosystem. So examples of keystone species, beavers. So beavers, what they do is they create, um, you know, dams, and they help create this wetland system in the process of that. And wetlands are a great habitat to waterfowl. So you have increased waterfowl population. Uh, not only that, because you have created a wetland, fish population will also increase. And so beavers are considered keystone species. Sea otters uh, create the kelp forest. So I think my diagram, yes. So this is a sea otter. And sea otters, what they do is they eat sea urchins. And sea urchins eat kelp. Now, if you don't have sea otters, the, the population of the sea urchin explodes. It increases exponentially. And there's so many sea urchins that they overgraze or eat all the kelp. And when you don't have kelp, you don't have this under water forest ecosystem where animals live and thrive. So sea otters, what they do is they keep the sea urchin population in check so the kelp can thrive and provide homes to many other species. So sea otters, another great example of a keystone. And here's another diagram of that archway where that center stone holds it intact. Okay, the final thing I want to talk about is symbiosis talking about some very close ecological relationships between different species. Literally, they are in direct contact with each other. And the word symbiosis means living together. Now, there's three types of symbiosis. You have neutralism, commensalism, and parasitism. Neutralism uh, is when both organisms in this relationship benefit from one another. One organism gives this organism something that's useful and vice versa. In exchange, it, it will give that organism A, you know, something that um, that is useful to them. So I got some examples of that coming up here. Um, commensalism. One organism receives a benefit while the other organism does not benefit, but it's also not harmed. Okay. And then parasitism is one that is harmful. There's this relationship where it directly harms the host. So one organism will benefit, the other organism will be harmed in the process of it. So let's see if we can identify these examples. So here I have a bat and a saguaro cactus. The bat depends on night blooming cacti as its primary source of food. Cacti are a rich source of fruit and nectar, staples of the bat's diet. Saguaro cactus. As the bat feeds on the cactus fruit, it also ingests the seeds. These ingestible seeds are dispersed to new locations as the bat flies across the desert. So here, what's the bat? Like, is it um, being, does it benefit? Is it harmed? Or is there, it's not being harmed or nor uh, benefits? So this is kind of like neutral. Well, this description describes that the bat is benefiting from the cacti. Now let's look at the cacti. It feeds on its fruit and ingests the seeds, and the seeds are dispersed in new locations, thus increasing its population with dispersion and distribution. So yeah, the cacti benefits from that. 
So here we have a positive and a positive relationship where both organisms benefit. This would be considered a neutralism. Okay. Let's take a look at another one here. Human. Our eyelashes are home to tiny mites that feast on oil secretions and dead skin. Without harm in us, up to 20 mites may be living on one eyelash follicle. Sorry if that really grossed you out. Demodiclids. Eyelash mites find all they need to survive in the tiny follicles of eyelashes. Magnified here 225 times, these creatures measure 0.4 millimeters in length and can be seen only with a microscope. So humans, are we being harmed, benefit, or neutral? Well, it says without harm in us, nor does it benefit us. So that would be neutral. Eyelash mites benefit. So this would be an example of commensalism. Some other examples of, I guess I was going to talk about other examples here. So other examples of neutralism would be like bees and flowers, okay, where they both benefit from each other. Um, uh, fungi and plants, mycorrhizoids to be specific, they benefit from each other. Plants give them sugars and the fungi give them nutrients. Commensalism, uh, I think your book talks about barnacles and whales, where the barnacles are just being dispersed anywhere, but they don't harm the whale. Okay, this last one. Horn worm caterpillar. The host horn worm will eventually die as its organs are consumed by wasp larvae. Here we have the brachioid wasp, where the larvae feed on their host and release themselves shortly after being, before reaching the pupa stage of development. So the caterpillar, it dies. Dang, that's harmful. The wasp gets food, which benefits. This would be an example of parasitism. You just see like those wasps hanging on that hormone caterpillar. Okay, so uh, we talked about factors that, de that describe habitats and niches. We talked about competition, specifically competition, um, competitive exclusion, I think is what it was called. Um, keystone species, and then the three primary ways organisms depend on each other. I didn't really talk about this one, herbivory shapes communities because it's pretty self-explanatory. Animals that eat plants can shape communities. So, yeah. All right, so that does it for 6.1 part two. So our next lecture, we'll talk about succession.